All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight here at Burlington City Arts. I'm Sarah Jane. I am the public programs assistant here and a gallery educator, and we are so thrilled for tonight's exciting program. So this program is a part of Obscura BTV, the city of Burlington's official eclipse celebration. Some of you might know this, but the last time Vermont experienced a total solar eclipse was in 1932, and the next one will be in 2106. So unless you have a long life ahead of you, which I hope you all do, this might be your once in a lifetime opportunity to see something so exciting. In celebration of this amazing astrological moment, we are delighted for tonight's presenters to share their own creative perspectives on the sky. Claire Pascal, who will be reflecting on the passage and energies of the moon. Tina Escaja, reading from her award-winning bilingual astro poetry with her translator, Kristen Dykstra. Um, and Brian Drawer, who will be discussing his stunning work included in his exhibition, Celestial Skies, which is on view here in the Lorraine B. Good Room. Um, whether you're an eclipse chaser visiting Burlington or a local here excited to learn more about this exciting moment, we hope you enjoy tonight's program. And then following our three talks, um, our presenters will be at the two tables in the back corners. Um, so if you have questions or want to share your excitement with them about all the things they shared, please check those tables out. And they will be selling books, um, classes, and prints and greeting cards. We are starting off our presentation with Claire Pascal, who is the co-executive director of Sangha Studio, a nonprofit donation-based yoga studio with multiple locations here in the Burlington area. She is a 200-hour experienced and registered yoga teacher. And Pascal is a green witch who has been practicing the art of witchcraft and magic for over a decade and draws from experience with tarot, astrology, candle magic, herb herbology, and animism. So. Without further ado, Claire. Thank you. How's everybody doing? Good. Good. Thank you. Yeah, I'm all right. I'm in a group of lots of people. Um, who's already feeling maybe some of the intensity of the weekend? either because of energetically or maybe you just had to like find parking downtown a minute ago. <laughs> um, you know, whatever perspective you have, I think we're all kind of feeling the excitement and like that collective energy that comes with what can be a once in a lifetime event. So I thought it would be nice if we could all start with a group breath, open our time together, call that energy into the room. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, as individuals and a collective, we're about to experience a really powerful moment. Um, and whatever you, you believe, you're about to be a part of that. So if it feels comfortable, I invite you to close your eyes or soften your gaze. And we'll start by emptying out all of our air, taking a nice deep exhale out. And as you start to draw a breath, back in, filling through the belly, expanding through the chest, maybe finding a brightness or an expansiveness as the air reaches into the shoulders. And then as you get ready to exhale that breath out, maybe feeling a letting go or a release, opening your eyes as you feel ready again. And so we arrive. I thought I'd start with what is astrology. Um, I know as a mixed room, we may all have different experiences and backgrounds with that field. For thousands of years, astrology and astronomy were practiced together, mostly because we didn't know that we weren't the center of everything. Um, as we've learned more about the solar system, we've understood that we kind of all orbit around the sun. But astrology, for all of its purposes, is really places a human's lived experience at the center of what is the energy of the cosmos. Prior to the 16th century, we kind of had this geocentric view of the Earth is at the center of everything and the universe is revolving around us. And astrology still really views the world that way. So it looks at things from the Earth and kind of what the sky is doing from that perspective. At 
the heart of astrology is the zodiac. The zodiac are 12 constellations that fall at the same latitude as our solar system. There are dozens and dozens of constellations, but these are the 12 that kind of align with each planet as they orbit around the sun. From these, we're able to study each planet and the celestial bodies that stem from those, like the moons, the stars, comets, all as they relate to the zodiac. We use these zodiac signs to anchor someone's natal or birth chart. Your birth chart really is just a map of the universe as it looked at the exact place and time that you were born. Some of you may know some of your signs in the zodiac. Maybe you know your sun sign. <coughs> Excuse me. Are there any Aries in the room? Yeah. How are you doing? <laughs> um, the solar eclipse that we're about to experience is in Aries. It means the moon's in Aries, the sun is in Aries. And not to say that the other zodiac signs won't experience the intensity as well, but if you're in Aries, you may be feeling some feels. <laughs> um, our natal chart is unique to us. Our birth chart is where we find information like our sun sign. In reality, we all have many signs within our birth chart, but we often kind of read from the top three, which is your sun sign that you may know. That's what you read your horoscope off of. You may also know your moon sign, which is where the moon was at the time that you were born, and your rising sign, which is in relation to the exact time and place that you were born. What does all this have to do with the moon and eclipses? As our closest celestial body, the moon plays an integral role in how we experience the energetic shifts of the solar system here on Earth. To talk about eclipses and their astrological significance, we have to first look at the moon as a total and how it energetic, energetically impacts us on our planet and us as individuals. Whether you're a firm believer in the power of the cosmos and their deep impact on us, or maybe you're a staunch skeptic and everything I'm saying doesn't land. What I love about the moon is on some level, I think we can all agree that the moon is a powerful energetic force on our planet. <coughs> From a scientific perspective, we know it controls the rise and fall of the tides. And in doing so, it has a huge role in the ecosystem of our planet. The moon falling out of the sky would be a catastrophic event that would end life on Earth as we know it. As someone who loves the moon and feels it deeply impacts me energetically, I've often been asked sometimes if I believe in the moon. But I think we all can agree we believe in the moon. Um, to me, the moon is kind of universal in that way. We can all see it. We can all experience it. We can all be in some agreement that impacts deeply life as we know it. And as an energetic being, we're, we're part of that. It's not separate from us in any way. For many reasons, the moon's orbit around the Earth, which is a cycle of roughly one month, give or take, has a deep, deep impact on life on Earth. And this holds astrologically true as well. To understand the impact of the moon on the Earth, we look to the sun. The energy of the moon is guided by eight phases. I think the most notable that we all kind of know are the new moon and the full moon. The new moon is when the sun and the earth, the moon comes between the sun and the earth. And the full moon is when the earth is between the moon and the sun. For solar eclipses, it is always in the new moon. As the moon orbits the Earth, hitting these eight different phases, the energetic properties of the moon and how you might feel that energy changes. With a full moon, we tend to experience energetically what is a release or a letting go, a time to move forward, a time to maybe give up old patterns, a time to move away from things that aren't serving us. It can be a time to cleanse. With the new moon, we often find a time of renewal, of starting fresh, of new beginnings. So maybe that which you cleansed or got rid of in the full moon, it's now time to find space for something new. <clears throat> These are our solar eclipses and what we'll experience on Monday. From an astrological perspective, the significance of a total solar eclipse 
is a little bit, it's a once in a lifetime experience that we'll have geographically here um, because we will experience totality. But from an astrological perspective, we're experiencing eclipses all the time. We even have what's called eclipse season, which is every six months, we have a period where we experience a lunar and a solar eclipse. So while unique in what we will experience this Monday from a visual perspective, astrologically, we have cycles of this all the time. <clears throat> this total solar eclipse, as we kind of talked about before, is in Aries, 19 degrees. Eclipses in each zodiac come in waves as a series. So this solar eclipse that we're experiencing on Monday is actually the fourth lunation in what is a six-part series. I think what can be a really interesting point of inquiry is to look at the other eclipses and the dates and think back on what was going on in your life. What were you experiencing? What changes have you seen? <clears throat> You can look to the earlier eclipse dates of April 20th, 2023, October 14th, 2023, and March 25th, 2024. Future eclipses in this series will take place on October 2nd and March 29th of next year. <laughs> my, kid, my kiddo's here. Um, often impactful changes happen both on a collective and individual level from eclipses, but they unfold over time. So it's not some transformative, energetic moment that happens right at the point of totality, but rather it's a beginning of things that could unfold over many, many months or even years. What is the specific energy of this eclipse? As we kind of talked about, it's intense. Aries is a sign ruled by the planet Mars, and as a fire sign, its energy is intense. This is a sign that is rooted in competition, but also in resilience, in strength, and in stubbornness. It's the first sign in the zodiac, and therefore it can be rooted deeply in autonomy, in a sense of self, a sense of individualism, independence. It's kind of known as the get shit done sign. Um, Accordingly, the energy of this eclipse is inviting us to tap into our inner strength and fortitude. It's a time to find resilience. It's a time to embrace maybe that which we can't control. It's a time to think about what do you really want and how will you achieve that. And just as the moon blocks the sun during a solar eclipse, it's a powerful time to glean insight into whatever might be standing in your way. Something that's particularly unique about this solar eclipse is the comet Chiron will also be conjunct the sun. We call this a Kazemi. Kazemis are particularly interesting because they can happen at any time, but when they overlap a solar eclipse, they can be incredibly powerful. And this one is unique because Chiron is known as a sign of healing. It's known as the wounded warrior. It's represented by a centaur. It can bring a softening to the intensity of Aries. If Aries is the sign that wants to blow everything up in your life, Chiron is the thing that wants to help you fix it and put it back together. So carrying these forward together is important and impactful. In short, what we're really headed into is a time astrologically of great emotional realness and upheaval, and you can expect some real life-altering and pattern-disrupting changes. But with that, I think the astrology of this moment also reads that we can expect a renewal and maybe what's possible forward. With that, I'd like to close this out with a breath. If it feels comfortable to close your eyes once again, come back to your breath. I hope I've left you with some insight into the energies of the moment. 
and perhaps some ways to harness the power of the moon and sun to find a sense of renewal and healing forward. And wherever Monday takes you, I'll leave you with this. May you be held in loving kindness. May you be happy and safe. May you be healthy in body and in mind. May you always have enough. May your heart know peace. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claire, for starting off our night. If you haven't yet, definitely check out Sangha Yoga. I'm a member there and thoroughly enjoy every class. Um, there is even yoga classes that play solely Taylor Swift. So if that excites you as much as me. Our next presenters are Tina Escaja and her translator, Kristen Dykstra. Tina will be presenting from the bilingual edition of her book, 13 Moons 13, which won the 2023 International Latino Book Awards for both the Spanish poems and the English translations by Kristen Dykstra. Escaja's poem, poems, fiction, and digital work have appeared in numerous collections and have been translated to dozens of languages. She is a writer, digital artist, and distinguished professor of Spanish and gender and women's studies at the University of Vermont. Kristen Dykstra writes about people, places, and culture with a special interest in motions and intersections amongst the Americas. Some of her publications are scholarly, while others are works of literary translation and creative writing. Dykstra has held a National Endowment for the Arts grant for literary translation and won the Penn Award for Poetry and Translation. Her translation of Escaja's 13 Moons 13 won the International Latino Book Awards Gold Medal in the category for Best Nonfiction Book Translation. So without further ado, Tina and Kristen. Okay, and there's another chair over there if anybody else wants to sit down. So two chairs are open if you would like to have them. I'm just going to ask you. Hola. Oh. Sí. Hola. Hola. <laughs> Buenas tardes. Oh, good. Nice. So happy to be here with this reading of Trece Lunas Trece. Perfect for the time, right? Of moons and eclipses. I have some students here, I'm so happy, so excited. So shall I start? Yes. So. Maybe this is not working. No? Oxígeno, 43%. Silicio, 21%. Aluminio, 10%. Calcio, 9%. Hierro, 9%. Magnesio, 5%. Titanio, 2%. Y níquel, sodio, cromo, potasio, manganeso, azufre, fósforo, carbono, nitrógeno, hidrógeno, helio. La composición de la luna. Oxygen, 43%. Silicon, 21%. Aluminum, 10%. Calcium, 9%. Iron, 9%. Magnesium, 5%. Titanium, 2%. Plus nickel, sodium, chromium, potassium, manganese, sulfur, phosphorus, carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, helium. The composition of the moon. Luna en Google. Uh, 
uh, with an epigraph by the Hubble showcase that says, the misty blue filaments surrounding the central starburst region are bubbles of gas. Ubicarte o no en el espacio. Saberte en círculo cierto que modificas y arqueas. Descubrir el lugar exacto donde habitas. Botrón o emplazamiento de tu hogar o aureola. Cartografía obediente a tu urdir de cosmonauta. Asumirte parte o no de un cosmos plástico esquivo como el córtex cerebral. Y al tiempo inmutable y justo, gigante y mínimo, partícula en perpetuo estado de expansión. Así, tus ansias de existir, de ser tú misma en alegato sideral, te precipitas. Polvo de una estrella marchita que estalla en múltiples fragmentos que ahora indago. Luminosa y agónica, supernova, destello en pleno parto o agujero infinito, infinito, te precipitas. Y de ahí emergemos, dicen, del fragor en el útero inmenso del inmenso espacio, del residuo apenas de una muerte estrellada que nos nombra y vomita. Nada soy. Y me acojo con ratón y emisario a la oferta de universo en Google, que me afirma burbuja nebulosa en expansión vigente, envuelta en sustrato sideral, flujo constante, arrecife o catarsis. Más allá del tiempo y la banal historia, la falacia de Dios, luna en Google. So these poems are Tina's own creation, but they're also part of a bigger conversation about the moon. It's a good forum. We have three different people already talking. Um, she has all these quotations at the start. In the book, if they're not in Spanish or English, then we left them in whatever language they came from. Uh, but I will tell you tonight what some of them are. This one you heard her read. This was already in English. It's from NASA and the European Space. Uh, what are they, the association? Um, Hmm? Agency. Agency, thank you. Um, and it, it's about the Hubble Space Telescope. The, min, the misty blue filaments surrounding the central starburst region are bubbles of gas. Moon by Google, locating yourself or not in space. Self-knowing in a perfect circle which you modify and measure. Discovering the exact location you inhabit, the smudge or site for your home or halo, cartography obedient to your cosmonaut weave, assuming yourself or not part of an evolving cosmos, evasive as a cerebral cortex, at once immutable and just, gigantic and minute, a particle in a perpetual state of expansion. Your existential doubts are like this, doubts about being you, yourself. In stellar summation, you speed up dust from a wilted star bursting into the many fragments that I now probe. Luminous, anagonal, supernova, a glint in active labor, or an infinite, infinitely black hole. You speed up. And they say we emerge from there, from clamor in the immense uterus of an immense space, from faint residue of a star's death that names and disgorges us. Nothing. I am, and I accept myself with my mouse, emissary to the supply of universe by Google that affirms me to be a bubble, nebulous, in ongoing expansion, coated in cellar substratum, continuous flux, reef, or catharsis. Beyond time and the commonplace story, the fallacy of God, moon by Google, Sounds, sounds beautiful in English. <laughs> oh, thank you. So, NGC 2239. <clears throat> Nebulosa Rosetta. 
and a quote from Dante Alighieri, Paradiso. Noi siamo usciti fuori del maggior corpo del ciel che pura luce, luce intellettuale, piena d'amore. Averiguar el nombre exacto en la perplejidad misma del cosmos, su hilatura de hidrógeno y poema, su centro desprovisto y emergente que succiona lengua torpe, el torpe afán de inmensidad. La palabra, origen y alegato, verbo y verso, empireo, corola iluminada, mandala abierta, rosa. Sus justas coordenadas te piensan. So this one has not just one uh, quotation at the start, it has two. And I did not know before I translated this that Monoceros is the unicorn constellation. Anybody know that? <coughs> Monoceros, unicorns. Okay, so I'm going to actually read the first quotation that she did not read, which is highly technical. Right ascension. Zero six hours, 32 minutes, 19 seconds. Declination, plus four degrees, 56, 25. Field of view, 60 by 60. Constellation, Monoceros. Then she has a quote by Dante. And it, was, it occurred to me today when I was looking up the English translation from the Italian that in a way, maybe this entire book is a giant, uh, a giant argument with Dante and, um, and Paradise, the final, the final book. This is a quotation from the character of Beatrice, who is um, the guide for Dante um, in this piece toward um, knowledge and towards God. And the quotation reads, we from the greatest body have issued to the heaven that is pure light, light intellectual replete with love. And the translation is by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Ascertaining the exact name and the very perplexity of the cosmos, its art of spinning hydrogen and poem, its center stripped and surfacing, sucking out the clumsy tongue, the clumsy desire for immensity, the word, origin, and summation, word and line, empyrean heaven, illuminated corolla, open mandala, rose, its precise coordinates outline you. Nebulosa del Cangrejo. El epígrafe es de Sami Manzei, como la estela de una barca en el alba, de la que nada queda. Apunte estelar. El viaje inmediato perpetúa el residuo, fricción y agonía. No hay regreso. Crab Nebula opens with a quotation from Sami Manzei. Like the wake of a ship across the dawn, a wake of which nothing remains. Stellar sketch, the immediate journey preserves its residue. Friction and agony, there's no return. So we decided we would do a little language equity in this reading by starting the first four in Spanish and then flipping to start the second four in English, for those of you who would like to listen to the Spanish with a little more clue up front as to what is being said, um, I, we often find you know audiences have diverse preferences for what language comes first. Um, so we're doing mare tranquilitatis in English first. And it does open with a quotation in English from none other than Neil Armstrong. You may recognize Houston, tranquility base here. The eagle has landed. Mare tranquillitatis. 20th of July, quiet sea. Territory for lunar base. Obstinate silence of continual night. Tranquil dark. A horizon decanting its round blue moon, sculpted from storms and deep white clouds. Sea suspended inside itself, inside the cradle of an alien gravity, with a faint fleet atmosphere. Invention and cloak for poets and insomniacs. 
tranquil sea, no artifice or gods for protection, stony and inter eternal in repose. Sea, which history's duplicitous flight now upsets, a metallic demand for emissaries and echoes, its hook in the torn membrane of the moon. Mare tranquillitatis, from Nell Armstrong. Houston, tranquility base, here the eagle has landed. 20 de julio, mar sereno, territorio de base lunar. Obstinado silencio de las noches perennes, de la oscuridad tranquila, de un horizonte que escancia su luna de azul redondo, modelada en tormentas y en blanquísimas nubes. Mar suspendido en sí mismo, en la cuna de gravedad ajena, de una atmósfera tenue y huidiza, invención y entresijos de poetas e insomnes. Mar tranquilo, sin artificio alguno ni Dios que lo guarde, pétreo y eterno en reposo, mar, que ahora altera el vuelo falaz de la historia, metálico afán de emisarios y espejos, su garra en la rota membrana de la luna. Space sickness, no quote but a subtitle, Spatial Adaptation Syndrome. Out of position always and in perpetual motion, the spacesuit, inadequate and foreign to the conflict between my senses and my suspended body, its mild vertigo, between masses that absorb light as if great eyes, diluted, envisioning options that I translate into retching, into ciphers advocating poems, winks hint hinting at external gravitational forces. I keep on floating, aerostatic, ill in search of a possible anchor, thinking myself a graviton as I oscillate among pluras and dimensions, perpetually adrift, multiplying or not, indiscernible, barely detectable in friction among words or within dark matter, maladjusted and curving into the void, into the nausea of a limitless sea. Space sickness, síndrome de adaptación espacial. Desubicada siempre y en perpetuo movimiento. El traje espacial inadecuado y ajeno al conflicto entre mis sentidos y la orientación frágil de mi cuerpo en volandas entre masas que absorben luces como ojos gigantes, alucinados, inventando opciones que traduzco en arcadas, en cifras que procuran poemas, guiños acaso a fuerzas gravitatorias externas, siglo flotando, aerostática enferma, buscando un ancla acaso. Pensándome gravitón yo misma que oscila en pleuras y dimensiones, perpetuamente a la deriva, multiplicada o no, indiscernible, detectable apenas en fricción de vocablos, materia oscura acaso, inadaptada y curva hasta el abismo y náusea de un mar sin bordes. In Search of Equilibrium begins with a quotation from Baudrillard. It is the truth which hides that there is none. Seeking equilibrium, the primary idea. Oscillating between self and reflection. Investigating, weightless and obstinate in my spacesuit, into the possible heart of the theorem, possible slant from this illusory cartography that names and programs us. Pointless and alone I investigate, a nomad afloat, deciphering the origin, my utopic existence as a self in effigies and nodes, in networks that spit me out and loop to fictitious similar selves. Meanwhile, I multiply circuits and wire, wired algorithms. They swell and diminish me, return a punctual me, a mechanical me, obedient, servile to a system I ingest and propound from my exposed body, unerring reference. 
the nothingness I am. And I go on floating, seeking equilibrium, the primary inflection, origin and norm of my dim restlessness and disturbed viscera. The real does not exist, just an essence of perpetual calibration without design or will. Buscando equilibrio. Um, el epígrafe de Jean Baudrillard, c'est la vérité qui cache qu'elle n'y en a pas. Buscando equilibrio, la noción primera, oscilando entre el ser y el reflejo, indagando apenas ingrávida y terca en mi traje espacial el centro acaso del teorema, el sesgo acaso de esta cartografía ilusoria que nos nombra y programa. Inútil y sola me indago, flotándome errante, descifrando el origen, la utopía de serme en efigies y nodos, en redes que me expelen y anudan a seres ficticios y afines. Y mientras, multiplico circuitos y algoritmos eléctricos que me expanden y achican. Me vuelven puntual, mecánica, obediente y servil a un sistema que ingiero y propone de mi cuerpo abierto referencia infalible. Nada soy. Y me quedo flotando, buscando equilibrio, la inflexión primera, el origen y norma de mi torpe inquietud y víscera alterada. Lo real no existe. Solo la esencia de un calibrar perpetuo sin patrón ni albedrío. Our final short poem is dedicated to one of the world's great space travelers. This is called Like a Poem. And the quotation from the start is from November 1957, National Society of Medical Research, about introducing a dog into a satellite. Abandoned in space, alone, drifting cosmonaut, the fragile curvature of a blue planet, her only shield, the poem, the metaphor, her gravity, and food, martyr to dreams and excess, orbiting Laika expires. Poema Laika. Abandonada al espacio y sola, cosmonauta la deriva la frágil curvatura de un planeta azul como único resguardo, el poema, la metáfora por gravedad y alimento. Mártir de los sueños y desmesuras, en órbita, laica expira. Thank you, muchas gracias. As we transition, I would also like to make a quick link to our other show, one of our other shows downstairs, our migration show. Um, it's got poetry and translation also, and I want to take a moment and recognize, um, have you all met Paula? Paula is here tonight. Paula Higa has the video installation in the basement. And it, it opens with a poem by Mario, who is here tonight as well. So please take the time to go enjoy their work before you head out tonight. But now Brian is going to bring it home. SJ, are you here to introduce Brian? Yeah. Thank you so much, Tina and Kristen. That was beautiful. Last but not least, astrophotographer and dark sky ambassador Brian Drawer captures the celestial beauty of the greater New England sky. Um, he is a fourth generation photographer whose exhibition, Celestial Skies, which surrounds us, is on view here at BCA through May 11th this year. Celestial Skies features a selection of images from Brian, who for the past 12 years has been photographing uh, the star trails, Milky Way, and solar, solar eclipses of rural Vermont and New England. These stunning images of the night sky, also known as astrophotography, 
convey the sense of awe and wonder the artist encounters when outdoors observing the evening stars. As stargazing has become less accessible to urban areas due to light pollution, astrophotographers such as Brian must often travel to remote dark sky locations so as to create images for others to experience. Brian's dramatic imagery conveys the excitement and power of the incoming total solar eclipse on Monday that creates darkness from day as the artist shares with us the sublime beauty of the night sky that so defines the human experience. So last but not least, Brian, take us away. <clears throat> wow, thank you so much for being here. I'd first just like to acknowledge the speakers who came before me. Amazing, it's such an honor to share the stage with you and uh, to Burlington City Arts for having me here tonight to share a little bit of my passion for the night sky and photography with you all and maybe give you a little bit of information you can take away from the presentation tonight. So without further ado, I'm gonna get started with a little bit of my origin story as a photographer. Let me see if I can, Ooh. excuse me here, technical difficulty. Here we go. Uh, I got my start in night sky photography actually a long time ago when I was in grade school. Uh, we were in Massachusetts and we got brought up to Vermont to Camp Abenaki as eighth graders. A counselor brought us out underneath the stars with transparencies and a sharpie and asked us to uh, trace our own constellations out of, the, out of the sky that then got put together into our own homemade uh, night sky map of the constellations. Uh, and that was the night that I fell in love with the night sky. Uh, and I never really missed an opportunity to view it from that point on. Uh, if you've never uh, gone out with kids and looked at the stars, it's a great activity. Clear a piece of paper, a sharpie, and make your own constellations. Uh, over the years, my style evolved uh, mostly in adventure photography, landscape photography, and live music photography. Uh, my father was a uh, black and white uh, film photographer, and I grew up around the smell of fixer and uh, developing chemicals, and it uh, stayed with me ever since. Um, it wasn't until uh, 2011, uh, we were on a trip to Arizona, that I happened to come across this image in National Geographic Explorer's photo annual, uh, captured by uh, Ben Canals. Features him laying on his back, looking up at the night sky over Crater Lake, uh, with the Milky Way above him, and I was captured. And I said, I need to do that. This is what I need to do as far as photography goes, and I started going down the path of figuring out how to do it. Three days later, I took my very first night sky photograph. Um, doesn't look like much, but at the time, it was stars, it was night, it had a little bit of the landscape in it, and I was a night sky photographer. <laughs> uh, from this photo, uh, I learned uh, and taught myself quite a bit about uh, forecasting northern lights, where to find them, how to see them, where to get to them, and that they were actually pretty common and available to see here in Vermont. This is a spot right up the road at Sandbar State Park in Milton. Uh, highly recommend if anyone's ever looking to see the lights. The 9-11 pull-off on the causeway is an amazing spot to see them. Uh, in addition to learning how to track and find northern lights and photograph them, I also had to learn how to be a astronomer, how to be a terrestrial weather forecaster, and a little bit of a cartographer to figure out where to go. Um, it's not as easy as just pointing your camera at the night sky. You actually have to uh, plan out a little bit where you're going, what you're going to shoot, how you're gonna shoot it, and what you're actually going to be able to capture from any given location. So knowing where the Milky Way comes out of uh, the horizon, knowing what stars are gonna be in the sky, whether it's gonna be clear or not, if there's gonna be air glow or light pollution in your location. Uh, so on top of photography, there's a few other things you have to learn in order to be a night sky photographer as well. Um, as part of my journey into photography, I'd like to think of myself as an ambassador for the accessibility of the night sky as well. Uh, coming to Vermont is something thousands and thousands of tourists do every day, and you get to see foliage and cows and barns and the lake. Not many of them get to see the night sky 
uh, when they come here as well. And I love showing people that just down the road from Burlington, this is four miles away up in Colchester and Mallets Bay, the northern lights shine above us when the conditions are just right. So with a little bit of dedication and keeping uh, the hard pants on for a little bit later in your day, you can go out and experience a little bit of the wonder of the night sky here in Vermont. Um, as part of my uh, photography, I like showing people what the night sky has to offer. And to do that, it oftentimes uh, means showing a really wide view or a panoramic view of the sky. On this particular night up in the Northeast Kingdom, um, I saw the largest Northern Lights display I've still seen to this day in 13 years of uh, filming uh, the Northern Lights. In order to capture this, it's actually a panorama. It's uh, eight photos in two rows. Uh, that were then stitched together and the wide angle lens gives the impression of the, uh, the curvature of the earth. It's called Alice in Wonderland Barn uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, this is uh, just outside of Enosburg Falls on Route 104, um, just before you get in large uh, shaker red barn. Um, the panoramic photography evolved, and this is actually an image that's available over on the side here, and from single eight images to uh, close to 48 individual images, three rows. Each row has uh, seven photos across, and each photo is actually a combination of between five and 10 individual images that are stacked on top of each other for greater fidelity to give you even more definition into the sky above. Um, so it's a constant evolving process of also learning different editing techniques and ways of bringing the entire night sky to you so that when you look at the image, you're seeing exactly what you would see looking up at the sky. You're not missing anything. Unfortunately, uh, it's getting harder and harder to find places to take those images. Remote Maine, uh, far-flung corners of Vermont. On the left side of the image, you can see a light pollution map of the United States. Uh, the brighter the colors you see are, the harsher, the brighter the lights are, city areas, urban areas. The darker the color, the darker the skies are, and the clearer the stars are going to be. You can see the East Coast is pretty saturated with light. Uh, here in Vermont, there's only a few precious spots left where we can go to get true uh, what we call Bortal 5 to Bortal 9 dark skies where uh, you don't get effects of the light pollution. Uh, up in the Northeast Kingdom, down in central Vermont, and uh, my personal favorite area in the Groton State Forest area. Um, if I were to be able to create a dark sky preserve here in Vermont, this is the area I would do it. Uh, Kettle Pond, uh, Ricker Pond State Park area. If you're looking for a place to see the stars, grab your inner tube, go down to the beach, sit in the water and look up at the skies. Highly recommend it. Uh, an example of why it is that we have to go as far as we do in order to get to the skies that we want to see is that the city lights block out most of the stellar light that we would be able to see. And the further away from the cities we get, the darker the skies are. As expansion starts happening, as population starts coming in and density starts spreading out out of the cities, the light starts spreading with it and our ability to see and experience the night sky uh, decreases. There's a couple different types of light pollution that we have to fend with. Some of them are things that we just really can't do a whole lot about. Uh, glare and sky glow from cities. Um, the bigger the city, the bigger the light glow. And you'll see in just a minute what the effect of a large city like Montreal, Sherbrooke, even St. Johnsbury and Newport have on the horizon around you. Uh, but on a more smaller personal level, uh, light trespass and overlighting are things that we can do and we can affect as individuals in our own homes, in our own neighborhoods, in our own communities. Uh, how many people have a light in their backyard that shines every time their dog goes outside, but isn't shaded, so it shines light up, down, and out? Simple shade over that blocks light from going up. If everybody put a shade on their lights, that's that much less light that's going out into the night sky to decrease what we're able to see. 
over lighting, refineries, gas stations, shopping malls. Um, if you look across the lake at night, you can see Denimora Prison. Uh, these are all things that are otherwise uh, soars on a dark sky that with a little bit of shading, a little bit of work, maybe a more natural spectrum of light, wouldn't be that visible in the sky. The International Dark Sky Association, if this is something that interests you, or if uh, reducing light pollution, if finding resources for things that you can do as individuals, the International Dark Sky Association is the certifying body for dark sky parks and preserves. The closest true preserve to us is Cherry Springs Park in Pennsylvania, though uh, Pittsburgh State Park in New Hampshire is in the process of being certified as a preserve. It's not big enough to be a true park, but hopefully we can protect that area up in northern New Hampshire to be a true dark sky area to be saved for a long time to come. IDA.org is a great resource. It's all free, and anybody can become an ambassador of the night sky. It also happens to be International Dark Sky Week, and they would love the visit from you to learn more about how you can help. A couple other really important resources. The Globe at Night started as a small group of citizens up in northern England tracking and uh, putting out on the internet information about light pollution in communities. It's grown to be a global community of really up-to-date information on what's happening in your community to help protect and help mitigate light pollution. Um, Clearskychart.com, uh, if you're gonna go out and spend the time not sleeping to see the night sky, it's important to know that you're going to be able to see the sky. So going to Clear Sky Chart is gonna give you an idea of what the, the cloud cover is gonna be. Uh, anybody here see the eclipse? This is the resource you use to finding out what the cloud cover is going to be. Uh, light pollution map, we saw just a, a brief glimpse of uh, a couple slides ago. It was on the left-hand side. And you can scroll into your own individual community. You can scroll out to see your state, uh, your entire region, or the country itself. Uh, here's a perfect example of the effects of light pollution on the night sky. This is a photograph of the Milky Way from the top of Jay Peak up in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont. From the left to right, you see Montreal, Sherbrooke, Newport, Montgomery, Lowell, and everything in between. You see examples of light scatter, you see uh, glare, you see sky glow is the yellow metal halide light that you have in the sky from the density of lights that happen between Sherbrooke and Montreal. Um, and it is about three to five stops of light difference for anybody who is a photographer um, in the room. So it's a pretty drastic difference of light between pointing towards Montreal or pointing up towards the dark skies of Maine. Dark sky map is the polar opposite of the light pollution map. This is where we go to find those dark sky places in Vermont. Uh, you can get really close in. Uh, you don't have to be in the most remote area if you can be protected from the glare of the night sky. Uh, down in valleys, behind mountains that would block the view will sometimes help you in more densely populated areas. Um, if you can't get away, um, here's a perfect example of the photo behind. This is Spear Street. It's about two and a half miles outside of Burlington itself uh, in pretty urban areas, not too far from downtown Shelburne. Uh, but when the conditions are just right, uh, because of the way that the topography works, uh, we get to be blocked from the light pollution of Burlington, of Montreal, and it's actually a pretty decent place to get a view of the Milky Way for the first time. And now a little bit about 
the eclipse coming up, because I think there's a few people here who are kind of excited to see what's going on. Uh, this is totality. Uh, totality for us is going to last uh, just over three minutes and 20 seconds. Uh, it varies depending upon how close you are to the center line of the eclipse and where you are geographically to the eclipse path itself. Uh, a couple of phenomena that we'll be able to see in this eclipse that is different from 2017 is that we're now in solar maximum or approaching solar maximum, which means that the sun is at its highest peak of sunspot production, which means that there's more plasma and uh, gases emitting from the sun itself. So the corona is going to be significantly larger, and the corona is the white area around the sun. For this eclipse, it's going to extend several degrees below in all directions. They're also predicting that there's going to be at least two to three prominences visible. And the prominences are the arcs of plasma that are magnetically connected to the sun and haven't released yet an ejection of solar material. Uh, those are large enough that in any one of them, you could fit several thousand Earths. So they're pretty large, and they should be pretty visible in some of the longer exposure photography that you'll see. Uh, in addition to the prominences on the sun, uh, looking just to the left and up of the sun, you'll see Venus. Below and to the right of the sun, you'll see Uranus. Uh, and in between the sun and Venus should be the Devil's Comet, if it's visible by the naked eye. Um, uh, the Devil's Comet is uh, a comet that is visible right now. It's, uh, it's just below naked eye visible light, but it might be dark enough just at the time of eclipse that we might be able to see it. Uh, the, eclipse, the comet will appear somewhere up above and to the right of the solar disk, uh, and it would appear as a small green streak or dot in the sky. It's called the Devil's Comet because of the gases emitting from the comet form two horns that are the tails of the comet itself. Uh, while we're waiting for the eclipse to happen, there's several things that you can do to pass the time. If there happen to be trees or thick branches around where you are, you can look at the stippled light that emits through those branches to see the uh, crescent shape as the eclipse uh, progresses. Uh, if you got kids around, have them grab a piece of chalk and trace all the crescents. And as the eclipse progresses, you, they'll be able to see the different sizes of the crescent moons on the sidewalk. If you don't have leaves, as we don't have around here for the most part, a colander works really well. Uh, just bring out a spaghetti strainer, anything that has small slits that the light can pass through. Hi. Yes, sir. Tell people not to look through the colander. Next slide. <laughs> ooh. So, uh, a little bit about safety. We're all going to be looking at the sun for a long period of time, and that's really where the danger lies in the eclipse. The sun isn't any brighter or more dangerous during the eclipse than any other day that we uh, would have uh, visibility of the sun. But it's the amount that we're going to be looking at and the duration that we look at it, and that's why we need to protect our eyes. So for the periods from first contact, all the way up through totality, you'll definitely want to make sure that you have solar glasses on, a uh, solar viewer, uh, for little kids putting a plate over the solar glasses so that they can't look around the glasses is a good idea. If you're a photographer, having a piece of tape over your viewfinder so you're not uh, looking through your viewfinder wanting to uh, uh, magnify the sun into your eyes. Um, just be safe. If you're in a larger group of people, you'll very likely be around other photographers. They get very excited about these sorts of things, and you'll hear them say, glasses on, first contact, diamond ring, which is one of the phases of the eclipse. Uh, Bailey's beads would be the next phase. I'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide. Glasses off for totality. They'll tell you to put your glasses back on because totality is ending. So, they're pretty handy to be around when you're in these events because they've been studying these phases and the parts of uh, the eclipse and what they're going to photograph and how they're going to photograph it for a long time. 
Uh, we're pretty fortunate here that we're right on the line of uh, where we might actually be able to see a double diamond ring. And uh, the diamond ring phase is the last phase of the partial eclipse before totality happens. And it's the effect of the topography of the moon letting just the very last little focused bit of light through before the solar disk uh, covers the sun altogether. Um, in the total transition, you can see, we start with first contact on the right-hand side of uh, the image, and it progresses all the way through to Bailey's beads, which is the final shot here, where just a little bit of the sun's chromosphere is shining through, and it gives the effect of a beaded necklace around the sun. And that leads right up into the totality. Again, three minutes, 20 seconds of total eclipse here in the Burlington area. Uh, we should be looking at first contact sometime around 2.15, 2.14. We should be looking at totality starting right around 3.20, with uh, totality ending around 3, or sorry, uh, 3.26, with totality ending sometime around uh, 3.35, and then moving off of Bailey's beads and diamond ring, uh, and then ending at around 4.30. Um, definitely don't miss the second part of it. Um, it's just as good as the first part. You'll be tempted to leave. Um, we'll be staying for the whole thing. Uh, it's a once in a lifetime experience for a lot of people. Uh, I will say that the experience of being around other people during the eclipse is part of the fun of the experience itself. The collective experience of witnessing totality. It's an indescribable feeling of emotions and experience that when you get to share it with a group of other people uh, makes it that much more special for you. Um, the other thing I will say is that the next eclipse visible or total eclipse visible will be in 2026 in Spain. And I say that only because after you see the eclipse on Monday, you are going to want to find out when and where the next eclipse is so that you can go see it yourself. I saw this will be the third total eclipse I've seen in my life. I got to see one back in the early 80s as a child. I got to see 2017 with my friend Wes, who's here in the audience with us. It's his birthday, so make sure to wish him a happy birthday wow. later. Um, and as we were wrapping up for the 2017 eclipse, we were already planning for 2024. We're already planning 2026 in Spain. And we're also planning for Cairo, Egypt after that, with six and a half minutes of totality over the Great Pyramids. Whoa. Yeah, I thought that would get you. <laughs> it's, it's an experience that will change how you look at the sky and change how you experience the people around you. I highly recommend you give yourself the opportunity to watch the eclipse and don't watch it through your phones, don't watch it through your cameras. There's gonna be thousands of photographers here in town and all across the path taking amazing photographs. Experience it viscerally, experience it with your eyes and with the people around you. Um, and then share that experience as best you can because once you've seen a total eclipse, you will definitely want to see more of them. So thank you so much for being a part of my presentation, for coming to Burlington. Well, if that did not make you excited for Monday, I don't know what will. I want to give a huge thank you to our amazing presenters, to Kate, or I'm sorry, to Claire and Caitlin, um, to Tina and to Kristen and to Brian for this amazing program, um, and to all of you for joining us here at BCA and for our Greater Eclipse Excited community. Um, I'd also like to thank our communications team, event staff, especially Emma here tonight, um, our gallery team for their support with this program, and for CCTV for um, filming this program and making it accessible to more folks. If you haven't already checked out, um, or if you need any Eclipse glasses, we do have those for sale here and across the city. Our director, Doreen, is sporting one of our amazing hoodies. 
So if you're looking for more ways to commemorate this exciting moment, we also have filters available for phone cameras so that you don't damage those, which I didn't know was a thing until I saw them for sale. Um, 20, I do have some more thank yous to give. Um, BCA's 2024 exhibition year is presented by Mascoma Bank. B Obscura BTV, the city of Burlington's official eclipse celebration, is sponsored in part by Northfield Savings Bank, Patrick Leahy, Burlington International Airport, Hilton Burlington Lake, Champlain, L Hotel Vermont, Courtyard by Marriott, Burlington Harbor, and Hilton Garden Inn. Pre our presenting media sponsor is WCAX, and we have additional media support from Seven Days. Um, I also want to encourage you again to check out our tables in the back um, to buy some greeting cards from Brian, to sign up for a class at Sangha, and to purchase one of Tina's books. Um, again, they are such creative people, and we're so lucky to be in a place with so many creative folks here. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of your night. We have lots of programs around the city, so if you haven't already gotten the BCA Events app, that has all of Obscura BTV's events across the city through Monday. And you should, if you haven't yet, go see Paula Higa's beautiful video in our lower level, along with the rest of the work in the Here Now exhibition on the first and lower level floors, and Margaret Jacobs' Kinship Across the Way. We're open until 8 tonight, so check those out, but we're open through Monday as well. So thank you. Thank you.